Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Silva Skillet. Alongside of me today is Marilyn De Garcia, my partner in crime, or one of them up there uh, at the State House. She's actually more experienced than me. This is your what, your third term? It is. So I have some seniority. <laughs> she could maybe be my boss, but <laughs> Marilyn comes from Salem, and uh, why don't you? Obviously, being young and everything, it's with our State House the way it's set up. Tell us what got you into politics and when you started and a little bit about yourself. Sure, so I started in 2006. I ran for my first term when I was 23. Uh, I was politically active in college and whatnot, but mostly on a volunteer basis. And when I finished college in May of 2006, I thought I started working part-time and I thought as the 06 midterm elections were rolling around that I would get involved somehow, you know, in a campaign. And so I started to kind of poke around and try to find out who needed help, what would be an exciting race or whatnot. And I, uh, a friend of mine suggested that I run myself for state rep. And so prior to that, it hadn't really crossed my mind, to be honest, it never had. Um, but I thought, you know what, I know the rudiments of campaigning. Why not, you know, instead of helping or influencing someone else to speak for me, why not speak for myself on behalf of um, those who are like-minded and looking to see kind of the same things occur in the state as I do. So I ran and I won and now I'm in my third term. So wh where'd you go to school? So I did a joint degree or a double degree actually at Tufts University and New England Conservatory of Music and then I did uh, my masters at Harvard. So you play, I didn't, I didn't not realize, what do you play? I play the harp. Oh, that's right, I should have yep. known that. That's, right. <laughs> that's kind of hard to lug around, isn't it? It is. It's very <laughs> awkward. It's about six feet tall and but it only weighs about 80 pounds so I can actually in times of extreme need move it <laughs> myself but otherwise I kind of I have a dolly and you know the whole system. I, I play the drums so my parents will do the same thing cart me around with drums but I have to ask you Harvard, Tufts, how does someone conservative like you, how did, is, was it a hassle? Were you like a real minority being a conservative or was it is it not what we think it is? Is it split up a little bit? Well, to be honest, I think, first of all, sure, sometimes the presumption would bother me, you know, if it were a situation or conversation about politics, the presumption would be that as a, you know, young female, um, you know, ethnic minority, whatnot, that I must be liberal and uh, I'm not. But going beyond <laughs> that, <laughs> going beyond that, I would say, um, it's a little bit frustrating and I think for all of us, I guess there are actually many like-minded people um, at those types of you know, Ivy League and whatnot institutions, but to be honest, most of the professors and in general, you know, things lean to the left, I guess I should do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I think we tend to be more quiet um, and be a bit more muted, you know, in, in terms of what we believe and maybe afraid to speak up on occasion. But of course, there are all the various student groups, um, Republican clubs and whatnot to be involved in. And then I have to say, undergrad was one thing, but in graduate school, I studied public policy. So there it was actually quite refreshing. Most people were able and willing to engage on a deeper level to talk about, you know, these issues that affect us all um, and, you know, it's kind of nationwide and globally and um, can kind of, you know, dig down kind of to the philosophical root of our various and differing viewpoints. It's encouraging to see that there is, you know, like I just get the impression, I just had my, um, my oldest son, but third in rank, he just graduated New England College. Mm -hmm. And even there, he's like afraid to, he didn't want to tell me what his father was. Oh, no. <laughs> Being, uh, you yeah. know, right here in Henniker. Yeah. But, um, well, yeah. Uh, to be honest, I mean, I have some stories of people who were told if you voted, for example, if you voted for Bush, leave the room. Like, a professors feel, you know, they're in an insulated envi environment where they actually feel like it's okay and they can do something like that and there's no recourse for students. and there's a lot of times no action taking on the professor. Another one, my brother's a doctor, and in medical school, um, in, in the, um, what do you call it, the, the lab with, where they have the corpses. Yeah, Sorry, in, what, what do you in, call in that? The, um, 
Yeah, in any case, in any yeah. case, they were talking about politics and Everywhere. exactly. Thank you. And a student, a fellow student, actually threw a piece of <laughs> biology, if you will, at him, which is completely not allowed as well. You know, it's just that type of thing, which frankly is persecution, <laughs> but um, you know, on a small scale. But it, it does when there's a confluence of that from you know your professors and your fellow students, and then just kind of the the driving force of conversation and whatnot, you, you worry, you know, because you don't want your grades That's to be right. affected. Exactly. So. I, I could see what would have happened to me. Well, let's go from politics to food now. So with, with all your education and everything, when, when do you have time to cook and what inspired you to cook? So my mother was born in Italy and is Italian, obviously. And um, so we have quite the culture of cooking, if you will, in our home. And actually, everything about cooking, baking, you know, you can kind of branch out and, and do a lot more. But honestly, everything I cook and can cook has a lot of sentimental value to me. Because um, if it wasn't something my mother made, then it was something my great aunt or my grandmother, who, by the way, so my name is Mary Linda, and my great aunt was Maria, and my grandmother was Linda. And um, so I was named after them. And they lived with us um, as I grew up. And it was kind of great having like a live-in chef straight sure. from Rome, yeah. <laughs> exactly. if you will, <laughs> and, uh, and central Italy. So, you know, all of, all of the things I make now are just things that I've grown up with. And actually, I wore this apron. I'll tell you a little story. My mother, this is my mother's name, Santa Rossi. And um, she made this apron when she was about 13 or 14 years old. So it does have some spots. You can't see them, but <laughs> no, so be careful. But I well, wore it just for that. <laughs> what are we making today? So today I would love to show you um, penne alla vodka. So it's pretty simple. It's a pasta dish um, using penne, these, um, this type of pasta, which is again, pretty um, common. Um, and it's simple, it's a cream, it's a tomato based and cream sauce, so a lot of Italian sauces, you know, tend to go either oil, butter, you know, cream based or um, tomato based. Mm -hmm. um, this one is a blend, so I think it's really nice. And then it has this little exciting element of vodka, <laughs> which gets people very excited. However, it really just, you know, evaporates, you burn it off. <laughs> it just adds a little taste, so. You can have it before. But, no, yeah, and, well, and then the other most um, important ingredient, which is near and dear to many people's hearts, especially men, I find, is the pancetta, which is basically the Italian form of bacon. So um, you can find it, um, it sounds, so it's pancetta, and normally, probably if you asked for it in a grocery store, they would reply with, oh, pancetta, because that's how you would say it without kind of the Italian accent. But um, it's really just a type of bacon, um, but it is slightly different from bacon. So if you just inquire after it um, in your local grocery store, they all do tend to have it, but um, that's what it looks like. It's bacon. And if you can't find it, you could use bacon instead, <laughs> and you'd be okay. So overall, I haven't quite ever um, calculated it out, but I think this is something that could be done in under a half an hour for sure. Um, and it doesn't really require a lot of preparation. I mean, butter you have, cream, oh, this is whipping cream, so that's pretty easy. But you could also use light cream, you could use half and half, it's not really that picky. The tomato sauce, um, just make sure, this is a kind, actually my mom made, um, so, you know, she would take the tomatoes and then, you know, carrots and meat and all of that and boil it and, and, and make that. But if there's a, you know, particular kind that you like in a can or whatnot or from the store, then you're welcome to use that. If you buy a store-bought one, you have one that you like to use? I don't. Because I never do. Because yeah, I, I, I find, <laughs> I, I find the ones from the store tend to be a little sugary or something. I think they're trying to appeal to the palate of I, it seems to be an American thing that we like things very sweet. Um, I don't in particular, so I like kind of the more acidic uh, tomato taste. Because I know a lot of people are afraid to make, but you know it, it's it's funny, with, especially with sauce, like mm -hmm. you know, like especially down in the New England area. A lot of them call it gravy because it truly is a family right, type thing. You, right. Just because you don't like it, someone else may or the other way around. It's right. Kind of a personal thing. Exactly. It's true. It's very personal. And again, 
that is just one that my mother has been making for years. And then, she, you know, she freezes it, keeps it in the fridge, just make How a lot. I argue with someone from Rome. I know. <laughs> I never do anyway, because I always lose. So. <laughs> we want to melt the butter and cause it to foam. So it's pretty much there. Of course, the danger is always burning it, but we're going to try not to do that. And then Pete told me that this is not going to melt, so I'm using it's it. It's Jerry's anyways. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with that. Okay, so it's looking nice and foamy. So now we're going to take the pancetta and put that in there. So everyone who's on a diet, this is great for your diet, butter and <laughs> bacon. It's always a good way to start. And it's really... You know what? Okay. All of Italian food is based around pasta, which is carbs, yeah. with complex carbs. And then there's meat. Bacon is a very important component. Um, it gives a lot of flavor. But, you know, the key to success in dieting and health is moderation, right? You're I mean, right. wine is good for you. Red wine is good for you. If you drink too much, it's not. Butter tastes better, to be honest, than um, all of these other artificial um, kind of, you know, uh, substitutes and whatnot. So if you just use it as is appropriate and just don't eat too much, you'll be fine. <laughs> I, I, so. I agree with that. It's not so. what it is, it's how much of it. Right, exactly. And, you know, and you should always try to have a healthy balance in what you're eating. So this could be your starter course and then, you know, have a nice vegetable dish or something with it. But So while we're waiting for a pancetta, what's coming up that you're working on the state house that's getting so, going? So yeah, so this is a very busy week actually. I mean, as you know, we'll both be in session like all day <laughs> for the next 3 days. But um for me, I've been working uh, my primary initiative and kind of cause of stress <laughs> this entire year has been working with um, health care regulatory reform and so uh, this week so my bill and the two bills that I was primarily involved with made it through the house and they have to do with um, reforming repealing or uh, creating an exemption of the certificate of need <coughs> board and regulatory process which um, was a result of a federal mandate in the 70s, and it sought to prevent um, overbuilding and overutilization of um, general acute care hospitals and medical facilities by put, putting a board and certain regulations in place um, wherein any type of medical facility or hospital that was interested in building or expanding or purchasing equipment or whatnot in the state had to uh, go through an approval process for that. Um, however, uh, that, so all of the states were mandated to have that in place by, I think, 1980. But then a few years later, I think 1984, the federal government uh, decided it was not being effective and they changed, you know, a variety of things because healthcare is changing all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, anyway, so it was, the states were left to do with it as they would like and a number of them repealed it and a number of them um, left it around and basically what it's become is a very protectionist type of um, regulatory situation where um, the hospitals you know in the state many of them that um, you know receive uh, subsidies from the state and whatnot and tax exemptions and all of this but they basically through the hospital association and those who inhabit the certificate of need board can prevent um, competition in in the form of the present day um, you know sort of next generation of healthcare, which is specialty hospitals um, so those would be like for-profit small facilities of about 50 beds that focus on one particular thing, be it oncology or spinal injury. The Federal Trade Commission uh, and the Justice Department have testified in various states in support of repealing it because it has become basically an impediment to development and has become a bit of a monopolistic situation. So anyway, those are the bills that I've been working with. Um, I'm trying to hopefully help develop health care and business um, in our state and that would be a step in the right direction 
because right now development is impeded by those that are don't feel unwelcome, you know, or feel as though they wouldn't be approved um, if they wanted to build in our state and, and help make New, Camp New Hampshire a destination um, area. Sorry, let me just get back to this. So the pancetta is browning. You can't really see it underneath the foamy butter, but it is, promise. Pancetta is definitely browned. So we're going to, at this point, hopefully once it starts bubbling again, we will put in the vodka, um, which is right here. It's clear. It smells like vodka. Is vodka. Um, I remember vodka has no smell. That's not true. <laughs> it does. Well, now they even have those crazy ones like whipped cream yeah. flavored and chocolate, I don't know, coconut, all kinds of interesting ones. But um, yeah, so anyway, well, just to finish up, I, um, so the, the point is that, you know, I do think as a younger person in the state, obviously being heavily involved in kind of what our state does and how we're shaping its future, I do, you know, think about our long-term sustainability and economic development and all of that. And uh, I really think that the innovation economy and high tech and healthcare are really the ways to go. Um, because that's, you know, that's just kind of the reality of our world. And healthcare is something that will be around forever. And then given our aging population, uh, that's the other problem we lose. We have so much brain drain from New Hampshire. You know, we have some great schools and colleges and whatnot, but a lot of students go elsewhere um, and then never come back. come back. Or they study here and then leave. So, um, you know, it concerns me that you know, we really need to be thinking of ways to um, develop our economy. And, you know, I don't think gambling is our only, you know, expanded gambling is, is our only option. I hope not. So I'm just trying to be proactive about um, developing our economy other ways. So, so this bill um, and in general, this reform could see as much as like a $500 million economic impact and create hundreds of jobs in the first five years of even one of these specialty hospitals coming into the state. And again, not to mention the, um, the fact that it would be greater health care options, high quality health care options for citizens and people from abroad. It's actually gotten a lot of attention. There was just a Boston Globe article the other day. Massachusetts isn't thrilled with New Hampshire's plans. <laughs> so they're hoping that uh, the Senate won't take action, right, which brings me back to the point that this is an important week because the House and the Senate has to finish um, acting on the work of the other chamber. So the Senate will be taking up these House bills. So hopefully they will um, deal with them accordingly. Well, like anything else, you add competition to something is when it gets better. You know, that's, right. that's the whole thing. Why, and why people don't understand that, I'll, I'll never get it. Right. I say it all the time with, 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 on healthcare when you just talk about reform when it comes to insurance. If we had interstate, the ability to buy insurance um, over state lines, I think you'd be a lot better off. Right. So I think that that's what they're worried about is competition. Right. They are, of course. I mean, everyone wants to protect their turf and it's just much easier to be comfortable and not be stressed about, you know, moving forward and developing and all of that when uh, you have no competition. I mean, that's just the reality of it. So I just realized I had this on the simmer side, so that's why there was no action on the butter <laughs> for a little while, but it's starting to foam again. So now we'll uh, put in the vodka in like 10 seconds, which should be fine. But the pancetta is very well browned at this point. And um, actually, it should be sliced, so little strips are better. This is diced, which is fine. It just means that when you're eating, you're gonna have these um, little chunks. But I was in a rush, so I had to, <laughs> I saw diced pancetta and they didn't Same have slices, so I, you know, there you go. Okay, now we have the foam back. So now we'll take the vodka and we'll put it in. And I'll just do that. Let it burn off. I can tell you it smells good already, but it you know th these are things that I'll take this over any day. The, that type of food. I'm not a mm -hmm. sweet guy. Mm -hmm. Really? I'm all all about salt and yep. spice and. Yeah. And so our water is just about to boil too, which is great. 
<coughs> because the pasta needs to um, cook for about eight minutes or so. And this, um, once we add the cream and the tomato sauce, also needs to simmer for about eight minutes or so. So it's nice that that coincides. <coughs> I think the vodka is burnt off or evaporated mostly. Can't really tell, but it doesn't really hurt. So I'm gonna take the tomato sauce and put that in there. So we thank mom for the tomato sauce. Yes, thanks mom. <sighs> Honestly, I like, I can't really eat tomato sauce other places, I just, it's, it's bad. And you know, it's really nice. I love the North End in Boston. And you know, now we have this nice restaurant, the Tuscan Kitchen, there's a shout out for them, um, in Salem. And it's very good, you know, they all do good work, but it's almost like immoral in my family to go out to an Italian restaurant and buy pasta. Cause my mother and you know, grandma, they was like, what? You're gonna spend $18 on a plate of pasta that I can make? Come on, you know. It's true though. <laughs> and they have a point, I know. Cause really, the interesting thing about um, Italian food is that it's really quite simple. And the reason is that it evolved kind of from peasant fare. I mean, it's very basic. You have tomatoes, you have olive oil, you have pasta, which of course, you know, they've made into very, you know, fantastic shapes and sizes and textures and this and that. But that's really all it is. Um, and, you know, basil um, and, you know, now by region in Italy, you know, you have tomato based or, you know, tomato is in a lot more pastas, different types of meats. Um, and then in the northern parts of the country, they use oil and butter more and whatnot. But really, they're pretty basic. Whereas the, the difference between Italian then and French cooking, which is obviously also delicious, is that French cooking was a result of, um, I believe it was Catherine de Medici, who was Italian, a part of the Italian um, kind of ruling class at the time. And she married into, um, I guess the you know French royal family or whatnot at the time. And um, she wanted to develop a type of cuisine specifically for the courts, if you will. And so she had chefs. So again, here we're talking, you know, the ruler of, <laughs> you know, the area of the time or whatnot, who wanted to develop a cuisine specifically. So that's where you have all of these complicated kind of sauces and whatnot. So I think French cooking is a bit more complex, um, which again, it still tastes amazing, but I think it's a little bit harder if you're starting out or whatnot to kind of wrap, wrap your and you around. can always fix a mistake in Italian food. Yeah. Just add a little more of this, a little more Yeah, that. exactly. Okay, so speaking we'll of a adding, there. we'll put some salt in the water first. I don't remember what that actually does, but it's you're just supposed to do it. So. Supposedly it keeps it from uh, sticking together. Okay. But some people put olive oil in there mm -hmm. too. Right. I don't know. <laughs> I do it. Yep. <laughs> Maybe your grandmother told you to do that and so you still do it. Maybe, which is fine. The thing is, so roughly eight to 10 minutes, right? But the thing about pasta is you just taste it. It's better to taste it sooner rather than later because I, for example, like my pasta al dente, so meaning it has a little bit of resistance I in your too. teeth. Um, and if you overcook it, then it's not, you know, it's too mushy and you can kind of end up with a mess. So now we're at this phase where we're pretty much getting ready to, uh, yeah. for old Pete to be able to try this. Yeah, this is still simmering. So now we need to add, um, just to give us another helping stir. Um, but we're gonna take salt and pepper. Now these are not any particular distributions of uh, weight or measure, but it's just uh, as a sample. You just wanna add it um, to taste is how they usually describe it, but um, meaning however you like it. I think a little salt is always helpful for everything because it brings out flavors, but remember you're working with bacon, so it'll be pretty savory already. And pepper, I like pepper, so I always <laughs> am sure to add that. And then, so that's still going nicely. Um, and then we'll just see how the pasta is doing here. Seems to be getting soft. Just blow on it. 
Yeah, that's half the time. I, that's probably why I don't eat. I'm tasting everything, and by the time I either burn my mouth or I'm full from tasting it, by the time it's time to eat. It These me. are pretty much about ready. They're so ready to go? Maybe another minute at the most. Then we have to strain it. <laughs> we'll take care of that. Great. Mix this a little more. So. Now, was this a grandma or mom recipe? Um, I think this one was my mother. Yeah. Because um, I actually don't know. I think, if I recall, that this is um, a recipe from Bologna, which is like central northern Italy. And my, my mother's family is from central Italy. Not that that really matters. The point is just that <laughs> I don't remember my grandmother ever making this, um, but my mother did. And everyone always loves it. And I will put this in the pot. Let me put it right back in. Go ahead. Missed one. Okay. Go. So we have a lack of pot holders, <laughs> hence our kind of rustic work here. It's okay. So we have that all in there. We just mix it around, make sure the sauce is fairly evenly distributed. And then the other important component, of course, is the grated Parmesan cheese. And that's something where you can add it um, right away and kind of mix it into the, you know, main pasta, um, you know, that you're working on. But then it's also nice to have some aside that you can sprinkle over each person's um, individual portion as well. So I've just added some here, add some more, and leave some of that. And then when you're um, stirring pasta, these are easier because of their shape, but you want to be careful that you don't you know, put in too much muscle and mix it too much because then you can make them kind of fall apart. We'll put it on this plate. Um, if you have a white, very geometric plate, everything looks like it tastes better. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. it smells pretty good. I'm getting ready to dive into it, I can good. tell you that. And well, that's a decent serving. That's a very unsightly spot of sauce right there. I apologize. Sprinkle a little bit of cheese. Parmigiano, again. There's a whole dramatic story about Parmigiano and what that actually is and where it's from. And of course, there's a whole regional dispute. In it. So this is totally crooked, but <laughs> there you go. Um, that is penna alla vodka. Well, Mary Linda, okay. thank you very much. We'll have to have you come in sometime again to make something else. Sure. And um, everyone, again, it's Marilyn de Garcia from Salem. Fantastic. And I can't forget to thank, once again, Roth, GM Roth, for this beautiful studio. It really is beautiful. And give us a place to uh, talk politics, food, and mm -hmm. give me something to eat on Monday nights. <laughs> so we'll see you again next week. I believe next week we'll have Ovid La Montaigne and continue down our road of politics, food, and uh, good times. Great. Thanks again to our guests. Thank you. Take thank care. you so much.